going to mug me. I'm not going to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. Hello and welcome to Legends of Opera, where we shall be delving into the lives of the incredible singers who have given us the heritage of opera. Enrico Caruso was the first internationally famous opera singer in the world and the first to record opera so that it could be appreciated by the ordinary person. Enrico Caruso was opera itself to probably all of the world at the time he was alive and afterwards. He really was one of the true legends. My goodness, I don't think anybody can say they're bigger than him. Neapolitan boy born in 1873 to a family with very few means. His only education was from the parish priest, and at 11, he was apprenticed to a local engineer of water fountains. Before she died when he was 15, his mother Anna had encouraged him to study music. He took extra jobs moving pianos so that he could pay for his first singing lessons with Guglielmo Vergine. I can't think of a single Italian tenor who doesn't bear the imprint somewhere along the line of Caruso's influence. Caruso busked outside cafes, and before too long, he was invited to sing at Naples Teatro Nuovo. This led to other small Italian opera theatres until he debuted at La Scala as Rodolfo. Suddenly, the world was his oyster and the Metropolitan Opera came calling in 1903. Very, very popular. We owe to him, I think, because before Caruso, there was no one who had meant so much in the, in the field of opera. Soon, the earliest forms of record companies would engage him, and his exquisite voice spread across the radio waves in the first public broadcast in New York in 1910. Puccini heard Enrico Caruso sing and said to him, Who sent you to me? God? Enrico Caruso was born 25th of February 1873. His father, Marcellino, was a foundry worker and a factory worker, and there really wasn't much money for their family. He was born as Enrico Caruso because he was born in Naples. That was a Neapolitan name. And later on, he Italianized it to Enrico, which is how we know him today. Enrico got a basic education with the local priest at nine years old. He joined the church choir. And that's where he sort of first discovered his voice. And like an awful lot of the great opera singers, his family wasn't particularly musical. They were very firmly a working family, and his love for music came from within. He left school at the age of 11. Um, his mother died very young. Working with his father as a sort of machinist, I suppose, fixing and building fountains in Naples. And apparently he used to point them out when he went home, you know, to people like, I may have built that and all that. So this incredible man. But he went against the grain, against luck, 
I went to the very, very top. In fact, he created a new level of top. At the age of 18, he had his first formal musical training with Guglielmo Vergine. He started singing everywhere and anywhere, in cafes, in restaurants, as a street performer. He came alive when he was singing. Enrico was required to complete his military service. He completed 45 days, and then he returned to his musical activities. His first love was music now. L'Amico Francesco was the name of the opera in which he made his stage debut in Naples at the Teatro Nuovo. There was no going back now. He was going to try and be a star. <laughs> very important conductor and voice coach, Vincenzo Lombardi, who really encouraged him to try and hone his high notes. He stretched him, he gave him these great exercises. It really transformed his voice, and we really see him in his early 20s becoming the much more mature singer. Caruso was traveling and singing all over Italy. Inevitably, he got talent spotted and was asked to appear at Italy's most prestigious opera house, La Scala Milan. It still is a wonderful place. He joined the cast of Umberto Giordano's Fedora, playing the role of Larisse. He began a very important relationship, a key relationship in his life with the soprano Ada Giacchetti. They had this very romantic, very passionate relationship in which they were always talking about singing and creativity and stage. And he wrote her so many letters. He wrote to Ada that his debut was a great success in Milan. And he said to her, I've achieved a great victory. My future is secure. Caruso traveled extensively and performed in Monte Carlo, Warsaw, and Buenos Aires. He returned to Italy and was offered a contract at La Scala in Milan. He debuted as Rodolfo in La Boheme. Unfortunately, he was feeling rather ill at the time. He was sweating and, and really feeling rather weak. The audience had called him out, but he really didn't have the energy even to go out and take the curtain call. And he actually fell to the stage and it took four people to lift him up. He has exhausted himself and needs to take a break. He wrote to Ada that he was becoming concerned about, about himself, about his blood pressure, all of these things. He's very nervous. This was a great trial for him and he told her so. His success in his debut produced very quick results, which is quite normal for someone who has that sort of talent. He went to Moscow, St. Petersburg. When he was in St. Petersburg, he sang for the Tsar, which is uh, quite something. I've often wondered how happy he must have felt to have broken that class barrier for a start, with no money. Now suddenly, there it was, it was all there before him. It must have been an incredible experience. Immediately people recognised 
what a wonderful singer he was and what the qualities were that were needed to produce that marvellous voice. He himself said, what you need with singing is intelligence, you need a colossal memory, which is important, the immediacy, the projection, the vocal flexibility of his singing was, was amazing. At the start of the 19th century, Enrico Caruso continued to tour around Italy. He was gaining a reputation and his popularity became even stronger. However, with all this success, his anxiety began at performing live on stage. In 1901, Enrico sang L'Alicia d'Amour in Naples. He famously got booed, which was hugely insulting to Caruso because Naples was his hometown. Um, legend goes that he had failed to pay what's known as a claque, so a section of the audience that would cheer for him vociferously. Apparently he'd failed to stump up the money for this and so he got booed by the audience and he then vowed there and then never to perform there again. Uh, he always said that he'd only go back to Naples to eat spaghetti. <laughs> Caruso was asked to return to Milan's La Scala to sing in Verdi's 1901 memorial concert. It was conducted by Toscanini, apparently 10,000 people lined the streets, so it was massively important for him. Enrico Caruso was now an international star. Most important turning point in his career was his employment by the gramophone and typewriter company. He was contracted to sing 10 arias in a single afternoon. Now, the repertoire that he sang were heavy and difficult and high. And, you know, apparently, he just walked right the way through it. It was priced £100, and we might say that is roughly about £6,000 now. So that is a huge sum for a record. It is easy to forget that he was amongst the first generation who could actually say, I've heard my voice as you hear it. Because, you know, a singer hears his voice through bone resonance. You know how funny when children hear their voices on the tape recorder for the first time or whatever. That's not me. That's not me, does it? Well, to think that these people could sing so well without ever, ever hearing their own voices is extraordinary. And he really made it possible, no question about it. These ten discs quickly became bestsellers. In 1902, Enrico is asked to perform at Monte Carlo with the beloved Dame Nelly Melba, the great Australian soprano, in La Boheme. So that's quite a performance. 
In her memoirs, Nelly Melba praised Caruso's voice, and they'd go on to sing many times together in the early 1900s. Enrico was invited to Covent Garden to make his debut there as the Duke of Mantua in Rigoletto. And Covent Garden like him so much, they ask him to stay and do a season of eight different operas there. So he's a real hit. He was here at Covent Garden many times between 1902 and 1914. He's an artist who, because of his association um, with this place, um, is, is important for us because I think that in our 300 year history, it's always been about the the greatest singers of, of the time, whatever era it is. And having those connections is, is intrinsic to what makes this place Covent Garden and why it has this very special and magical atmosphere. In Covent Garden, he was extremely popular. Someone told me that he, he had a suite there in that wonderful hotel, permanently, a large suite. And when asked, why do you do this when you're only here for six or seven weeks a year? He said, well, what about all my friends? They've got to have somewhere to stay. <laughs> Astonishing. Enrico has quite a punishing year in 1902. He makes a recording, he goes to Monte Carlo, he's in Covent Garden for all these different operas, and then he finishes off with a tour. He goes to Portugal, and then he's back in South America again. So he works incredibly hard. His work ethic is astonishing. The important thing about Caruso, and the reason why we remember him today, is that he was the creator of a number of new operatic roles in operas that are still performed today, are still very popular today. And so at La Scala in 1902, he created the role of Loris in Umberto Giordano's Fedora. Um, he also was the first Maurizio in Adriana Le Couvreur. He was the first Dick Johnson in Puccini's La Fanchure del West. So he really was the go-to tenor for a lot of Italian composers at the time. Puccini had created the music for Dick Johnson from La Fanchula del West, specifically with Caruso's voice in mind. In 1903, Caruso made his debut with the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. He plays in Rigoletto and he's a huge hit. It's the opening night, there's a huge applause for him. And as a consequence, the Met invite him back for every opening night for the next 17 years. That is incredible. You know, it does happen, but not opening nights. You can't guarantee that. They would put things on for him. Good business from that point of view, of course. But also for the enjoyment of the audience, and then they would come back and hear other operas. It's, it's, but he was truly popular. It's a very funny little story I heard about him. He would always go out and have some pasta after his uh, big rolls. And he went to an Italian restaurant. They were very, very glad to see him. Couldn't possibly sing something. He did. He just stood up and sang some Neapolitan song or other. He sat down, and at the end, they brought him the bill, which was enormous, which, of course, he considered to be very rude. Then he broke down, and my fee is... So you owe me whatever it was, a couple of thousand dollars or something. 
It's extraordinary, very funny. What a character. In 1904, Enrico bought a country manor just outside Florence to attempt to get some rest and recuperation. He was having some problems with stage fright, even though he was the darling of the Metropolitan Opera. He wrote to Ada that he was really suffering with stage fright, and he said, I, I get quite mean to everyone beforehand. The more famous he gets, the more he doesn't want to let down the audiences, and he wants to be perfect every time. Enrico continued with his recordings and he made long playing records, 78 RPM, with the Victor talking machine that later became RCA Victor. He was right at the tipping point, if you like, of recordings being a mass art form. And I think that he was part of the reason why they became a mass art form. The idea of buying a, a Caruso record led to the, the mass production and sale of millions of, of copies of his recordings. Even now, even though it's rather through a glass darkly, it's, it's hard to necessarily hear it with the clarity that you would expect from modern recordings, you can still get a sense of the extraordinary uniqueness of his voice. The advent of the recording industry was massively important for the world of opera. You could hear the great voices of the day rather than going to an opera house to hear them, you could actually hear them in your home. And it completely opened up the world of opera to new audiences. And people like Caruso became a household name, became a star. My grandfather brought a double album back from America called 50 Years of Music America Loves Best. And that was the first time I ever heard Caruso and talk about Start at the Top. It was a ringing tenor, even in that old recording, which is well over a century old now. And the presence of the voice, the emotional impact that it had, the fact that he sang from the heart and it went straight to the heart and it flew across the years like a jet plane flying across the Atlantic. It was unbelievable. And I loved the candor of his singing. It had a, a boldness, a sense of heroism about it and a beauty that uh, even now it brings tears to my eyes whenever I hear it. <laughs> Enrico Caruso was now a household name and a global sensation. Everyone wanted to hear the great Caruso sing. In 1905, he returns to Covent Garden to appear in Les Huguenots as Raoul and is a great sensation. The following year, he visited San Francisco to perform in a series of operas. During his performance as Don José in Carmen, the city suffered a terrifying earthquake. He rushed out and heard everybody screaming and running. And the only thing he took with him was a photograph, a signed photograph, of the President of the United States. It's just amazing. He stood in the street there, hugging this uh, picture. He got out and said later on that he would never return to San Francisco again. Caruso's success drew the attention of black hand extortionists. They threatened to damage his throat if he did not pay them money. After paying them an initial amount, they came back demanding more. Caruso turned to the police, who thankfully caught the two men behind the threats. It's well known that as he got older, Caruso's voice darkened. And one of the records he made was of the coat song from Bohem, as well as Che Gelida Manina. And the coat song is a baritone aria. When we talk about tenors turning to baritones and baritones turning to tenors, he was one who crossed the boundary more than once. While performing in the US in 1908, 
Caruso decided that American audiences had different expectations to those in Europe. He himself said that he adapted his voice to suit American audiences. Early on, you hear lots of emoting, lots of sobbing and so on, but the Americans weren't so keen on this. He found that when he sang straight, as it were, they liked it more. So he sort of refined his style to suit an American audience. Also that year, unfortunately, uh, he and Ada broke up. They'd had four children, but they'd never married. And it didn't end amicably. She attempted to sue him for damages. In 1909, Enrico refused the opportunity to go and sing in Australia with Dame Nellie Melba because the travel involved would just be too much. Singers at that time, it was a much slower world. So going to perform at the Met in, in the States, he would travel by ocean liner to get there. And so they would, singers would have much longer spells abroad doing a two, three, four opera sort of contract to save themselves all the excess travel. And nowadays, singers fly here, there, and everywhere. In 1910, he was one of the very first people to sing on radio. This was in America, and uh, therefore he could reach a lot of people. Enrico Caruso's recording of Vesti La Juba from Pagliacci, it became the best-selling record in America, and it actually also sold a million copies. He was one of the first superstars in opera that were incredibly well paid. I mean, the recording industry treated him very well indeed. And, you know, he liked to dress up, he liked the high society life that came with it. Caruso traveled the world as a solo performer and with the Metropolitan Opera Touring Company, giving hundreds of performances throughout Europe and America. The international popularity that Caruso enjoyed, without any of today's technological assistance, is astonishing. He had other talents. He was a wonderful caricaturist. There are caricatures, not only that he made of himself, but of the great conductor Toscanini, who he worked with. So he was multi-talented. He was a composer. He composed uh, a song that he recorded. So right across the board, he was somebody who had gifts. He was somebody who was a bit of a, a Renaissance man when it came to creativity. Enrico Caruso gets a movie role Paramount Pictures called My Cousin. It didn't do very well at the box office, and presumably this was because his reputation was due to his incredible singing voice. So what was the point of seeing him in a silent movie? In addition to his regular New York engagements, Caruso gave recitals and operatic performances in many cities across the United States and Canada. He followed this with a tour of France, Belgium, Austria, and Germany before the outbreak of World War I. By 1917, the United States had entered the war. Caruso did extensive charity work during this conflict, raising money for war-related patriotic causes by giving concerts and participating enthusiastically in Liberty Bond drives. He did a great deal of charity work during the First World War. Uh, drives for Liberty Bonds, which was very important. In 1918, Enrico married an American socialite, Dorothy Park Benjamin. She, at 25, was 20 years his junior. Her parents were really very against the match. But still, they had a daughter in the following year and seemed very happy. 
he was offered $10,000 a night to perform in Cuba. Approximately these days for one night is about 127,000 US dollars for a night. Now, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And he did lots of these. He'd go on, on a tour and do three, four, five of them. And, you know, incredible. I feel, I feel happy about that because he deserved it, you know. He really, really did. And not to forget that he was incredibly generous with his wealth. He used to have gold coins minted at Christmas and all the staff, you know, the cleaning people, the makeup people were given one of these. But that's the sort of chap he was. Very, very kind. When Caruso performed in Mexico City, his concert was transferred to a bullring to accommodate the 30,000 tickets sold. He chose an act from Marta, Pagliacci and L'Elisir d'Amore and was adored by the audience. Caruso greeted the crowds outside his hotel balcony as they celebrated the end of the war in 1918. In 1920, while Enrico was on stage, he was hit in the back by a falling pillar. This seems to have very seriously damaged his kidneys. Enrico Caruso travelled back to Italy to see his family. After spending time with his family, Caruso's dedication to opera was too strong to hold him back. Once more, he was on his way to America. In early December 1920, Caruso is on stage in the Lisa d'Amour at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, but he falls very ill halfway through. He has a throat hemorrhage and the performance has to be suspended. That's a very serious condition because, you know, the more often you would get um, nodules or inflammation. Detail on that is very, very hard to get. But it seems to me that the doctors were very frightened of getting involved because they didn't want to be the one to get it wrong. He wasn't very well vocally and uh, not very well, period. He lost a lot of weight, I remember. Uh, so it was very, very sad. There was much concern about his health, yet Caruso continued performing. Enrico Caruso's final performance was on stage at the Metropolitan Opera in La Juive. He played the role Eleazar. He had very bad bronchitis, but the doctor had cleared him the day before to sing. And this was his 607th appearance on stage in the Metropolitan Opera. Heartbreaking that it was his last.
Despite his strong desire to carry on performing, his health deteriorated. He had no choice but to travel home and rest. Caruso, the true performer, continued to act like everything was all right. He died on August the 2nd, 1921, in Naples. There is mystery around his death. There wasn't an autopsy. His funeral became a legend like he was. And it was the king himself, Victoria Emanuele III, who contributed, if you like, opened up the royal chapel for the occasion. And the number of people there was staggering. It was quite extraordinary. Real mourning. He was only 48 when he died, which for most singers is when they are at their absolute peak. Yet he'd been recording for 20 years. He'd been a top tenor for just beyond that. And so it's tragic that this voice was lost to us so early. And actually, if his span as a singer had been as long as most singers, just think what he would have gone on to achieve. Just think what roles would have been created for him. Just think, with the advances of technology, we could actually have a recording of Caruso in a complete opera. But it wasn't to be. Since Enrico Caruso's passing, books, films, plays, he's inspired so many art forms with his work ethic, with his brilliant voice, and with his dramatic personality. Caruso is something of an enigma because one can't get the detail particularly about his private feelings, his private life. I think he, he presented himself very well. You know, he was very classy and particular dresser. He was very proud of, of his appearance and things like that. As a tenor, he led the way. In the, not, it was not a revolution, but a transformation into the next stage of composition in Italian opera and made it work. He was a great friend of the composer. He, transformed the attitude of the, the audience, there's no question about that, who were not used to these very emotionally and very real, verismo pieces. And of course, transforming his vocal ability as he went along, I mean, that can, in sense, in his time, he was a very modern man, an artist. His nickname was the Matchless Singer, and he's counted as one of the greatest opera singers of the 20th century. Caruso made something like 250 recordings in about 20 years. Obviously not complete operas because they didn't have the technology for that yet, but it tended to be you know, short arias, uh, which were incredibly popular. His voice was well known around the world. Uh, Caruso was the first opera singer who became a star, like a pop star, you know, uh, internationally. He was the first one who started selling a lot of records at the time. Everybody around the world bought a record of Caruso, you know. He made, he made and he helped to make opera very, very popular. His voice, his tenor, was an extraordinary instrument. It was full of emotion, but also hit that level that people could understand and they could relate to. He was their tenor. The most extraordinary thing was that he was arguably at one point in time, the most heard human voice that ever existed. Although 
Although he died very young, his legacy through recordings continues, but also he inspired a whole generation of singers. You think of um, people like Mario Lanza, who made the film The Great Caruso. That's a film cited by Domingo, by Carreras, and Pavarotti as having inspired them as youngsters to want to be singers. So through film and through future generations, Caruso's legacy lives on. The incredible thing is, because of the wind-up gramophone, every household had a Caruso record. He was the operatic voice. You can learn so much from listening to Caruso, and you can be inspired, even if you don't aspire to sing. You can be inspired by the idea of singing, because if you could sing like that, you'd never stop. Caruso was one of the most famous personalities of his day. He can be regarded as one of the first examples of a global media star. The legacy he leaves behind and the fame he still holds make Enrico Caruso a true legend of opera. <laughs> <laughs> 